All right, I believe, there we go. All right, folks, uh, this meeting, welcome to a presentation about the very, very low level details of how we're gonna do import export in the world where we can't depend on pulp ID. Um, this meeting is primarily aimed at letting those of you that have read my document on this, ask whatever questions you have and bring up uh, whatever problems you have with the approach we're taking so we can, we can uh, close in on uh, the right way to do this if what we're doing right now isn't it. Uh, I'm going to share my screen so we can all see the doc. If I can figure out, come here, there we go. And I'm just gonna share the document as a window. Make that big. All right, so that should be readable. It looks readable to me on my other screen here. Everybody okay with that? Um, this is a long, complicated, dense document. I am not going to read it to everyone. I assume you have already at least skimmed it. Um, so there's a lot of detail in here about <clears throat> the mechanics of what we're doing because understanding the answer requires you to understand what, what handles we have to do this. But at a very high level, we are implementing pulp import and export the use case for that is there is an upstream pulp instance we're trying to grab out its data uh, based on repository versions and uh, provide that to a downstream pulp instance that is not allowed to do network connectivity. Uh, one of the key pieces of that use case is the downstream is not a, um, a hot spare or a replicated version of the upstream. It's its own pulp instance that has its own admin and all kinds of things might have happened to it. As a result, the import export process cannot own or change the pulp IDs specifically on the downstream instance because the downstream instance has its own and everything is connected and they do not match what's on the upstream. That is actually the, the majority use case for this functionality. So the entire um, thing we're trying to solve here is how do we do, how do we import when we cannot rely on pulp ID uh, to point out, the, to find the things that we're, uh, that we're importing. Um, there's an overview of what we do. We, we only ship artifacts that are different from the last time we shipped, but we do ship all of the, what I'll call the database content for the repository versions that you are uh, exporting and importing, and we replace those um, whole cloth in the downstream. Django import and export um, basically needs to be able to find a thing, an entity, uh, content, an object in the database in the downstream to, to determine whether it already exists. Because one of the things that it will do is say, I am updating this thing, I am inserting, I'm creating a new thing, or I'm removing this thing. And to be able to do that, it has to be able to identify the thing. That's a big part of what uh, Django Import Export does for us. Um, and then there's the complicating factors, which is what makes this really hard, which is why we're having this meeting. And I've got a few um, use cases that we already know are real world use cases, um, which basically amount to the downstream can have done a whole bunch of things, which means it no longer matches the upstream. Okay, so how do we, uh, how do we identify objects using Django import export when we can't rely on the primary key of the object? And Django import export gives us a couple of uh, abilities that we use a lot in here. Um, one of them is when you're defining a resource to be exported and imported, you can define its import ID fields. That is a set of fields that say, this set of fields uniquely identifies an entity, a row, if you will, in the database. Uh, in our context, in Pulp3's context, if you think about content, it has a natural keys um, method that every piece, every detail um, uh, overrides and says, these are my natural keys. Um, or they're just whatever you, the unique constraints happen to be, the unique together constraints happen to be on that detail object. Another thing that Django import and export gives us is when you're describing a model resource, when you, when you, model A points to model B using a primary key, you can replace that with what uh, Django import export calls a foreign key widget, which is a way to find the pointed to thing using a field other than the primary key. Um, the example I give down here is we can find artifacts, for example, in Pulp3 by relying on its SHA-256 field because that is guaranteed to be unique across the, the entire database. 
Um, I mean, we talk about natural keys here. The problem that we have is that there are entities in Pulp 3 that do not have natural keys. There's nothing other than whatever their primary key is, which is Pulp ID. That's all we have. And as noted above, um, we can't rely on that. So the, the four points uh, that took me a whole bunch of time to figure out how to work around are, Django import export lets us, uh, lets us identify something with multiple keys, which is great. However, you can only link things together using the foreign key widget in Django with one field, not a set of fields. And pulp import export cannot allow pulp IDs from upstream to overwrite the downstream ones. And finally, we have a set of entities in pulp three where pulp ID is all we have to rely on. So taken together, that is an impossible situation. And if we couldn't find a way around it, import export is basically done as a feature. We, it's, we have to take a whole different approach and not use this technology, which would be sad and disappointing. Okay, so what, what are we proposing here? What we're proposing at a high level is a way to transfer the upstream pulp ID and make it available to the downstream import process in a way that the downstream import process can use it to find things and hook them back up without letting it overwrite the pulp ID column in the database of any of the entities. That's basically the, the, the at a top level, that is the approach we're using. Uh, there's a couple more features of Django import export that we're taking advantage of to do this. One is in your model resources, you can say dehydrate a field name when you're exporting the thing. And what that does is instead of just taking whatever happens to be in that field in the model and spitting it out, you can replace that, that field with something else, whatever you want to do. It's a hook that you get to, to define whatever you want there. And then on the import side, there is a before import row hook, which gives you, here's a whole row of a, of a uh, model that I'm going to be importing and you can manipulate the data and do whatever you want to it and then pass it on to the rest of the import export process so that we can modify data before the import actually tries to create models and then persist them. So those are the two pieces of Django import export technology that we rely on to, to make this really kind of magic thing work. Okay, now we have, we come to the crux of um, the problem that we have is very pulp three specific, which is the master detail process. In pulp core, we talk about content, which is master. We don't know what that might be. It's just a content object. It keeps a, a set of very low level things. And then the plugins define their details and they're, um, you know, they're more, they can add more fields and they can have things like, for example, the detail models have natural key fields that actually make sense. Content doesn't, all it has is pulp ID. Um, so how are we going to um, export content in the content model, if you will, in that particular case? So what we've, well, the approach we're taking here is we're adding uh, a field to content to the master that we're calling export ID. It could be called something else. That's just the name I came up with. Um, at the upstream side, it's never filled in. Nobody ever touches it. On the downstream side, when an, that export ID is going to appear in the import models. And what it will contain is the upstream pulp ID of that model. And then it'll be persisted into the downstream database. That means that once that piece of content is persisted, we will be able to look it up by saying export ID equals the upstream pulp ID, which we found because it was um, a pointer from some other um, model that we're now importing. And the way that we are, hang on, I got to, if all pulp models had natural keys, we'd be able to use those. The problem, uh, Brian, is that even if everything had natural keys, some things have a set of natural keys and the foreign key widget only lets you only allows you to point to one field, not a set. So they, Django import export got this close and then tripped. Um, so that's a problem. Also, the it's the the difficulty is some of the things Pulp ID really is the only natural key. It's the only guaranteed unique thing in the entity. Um, so, but keep that in mind or even add it to the bottom of the document um, so that we record it because these comments won't, won't make it into uh, the document itself. So if, you'll, if you could take a moment while I'm talking and just add that to the bottom uh, question section, that would be great. Um, 
So what we're doing is we've def we're defining an export ID, which is empty upstream. The model resources are defining a dehydrate export ID, and what it's returning is the pulp ID of the thing that is being exported, and it's storing it in a in a uh, synthetic column, if you will, called export ID. Okay, so that at import time, now we could we can take advantage of export ID existing by using it in the foreign key widget because it's a single field. We can also look things up at before a row gets imported, and say, hey, there's a there's a thing here that has an up, I know this has a, an upstream pulp ID and we wanna find the object, the downstream object that it points to. Let's go take that upstream pulp ID. Let's look for the content that has that as its export ID and replace this entity with the new pulp ID, the downstream pulp ID, and then continue with the import. And I'll show you some code that does that as we move on here. Um, the worst offender here is the content artifact table. And I know we're talking about all the problems with content artifact and relative path, um, which, but it, that's kind of um, orthogonal to the problem of import and export. Content artifact points to the content entity because it's polymorphic. It doesn't know what the, the detail objects are. So it's a place where we are one of the only places, I think it's the only place I could find where we point explicitly at content as opposed to at the detail object that knows about the, you know, that has a pointer into the content. Um, and we have to be able to link up the content objects and the artifacts that they point to at import time. And that was the the, the rock on which we, we crashed pretty hard um, in trying to resolve this problem. So, Again, the way we resolved it is content has an export ID, which is its upstream pulp ID. And all the, the, the content objects are imported first. All the artifacts are imported. And now we're going to have to rebuild this table. Um, this is a really complicated example. I'm not sure if I want to go through it line by line, because saying it out loud makes it not make a lot of sense. <laughs> um, but the net of this is, at content artifact import time, we get a row from the content artifact table, which has a content pointer that contains an upstream pulp ID. In our before row import, we're going to look up using that pulp ID, uh, something that has that as its export ID and replace the content pointer with the pulp ID of the thing that's pointed to. So make a little more sense when I show some code and then we'll do all the import. And as a result of that, when we're done, content artifact now is pointing at all the right stuff because it, it finds the artifact not by pulp ID, but by SHA-256, as you can see here. And then here is the before import row where we have uh, an incoming row and that row has a content pointer, which happens to be an upstream pulp ID we're going to look up the content object whose export ID is that upstream pulp ID. So now we have the thing. And now we're gonna replace this row's content pointer with the pulp ID from the downstream object. This is the key right here. So I'm gonna stop for a second. Does this, does everybody understand what I'm saying? Whether you agree with it or whether you think it makes sense to do this or there's a better way, does it, did I explain what we're doing right here well enough? One question. If you export from an uh, instance where you just imported stuff, will it then reuse the, the export ID already in the database for all those relations? Uh, when you do the export, so I do the yes. import, so it has a bunch of export ID fields filled in, right? Uh, and they're there. Now I export that database. The, the dehydrate export ID is going to get called and the export, the export files, export ID columns are going to be filled in with the pulp ID, the, the, the actual identifier, not whatever happens to be an export ID. You follow so far? Yeah, the export ID gets updated every time you do an export. That is correct. It is the value of the actual pulp ID uh, in that current database that's being exported. That's correct. Okay. That's correct. Um, and I 
I think at some point, and it's been it has been a couple of weeks since I did a bunch of testing on this code. I think at some point I actually did a an export an import into a fresh database, then exported that fresh database and imported it a second time, and it just works. Um, and I could not possibly explain to you why it works at this point. I'd have to do it all over again. So one of the things about this is it is. There's so many balls in the air, if you will, at this point, and a lot of magic, it's really difficult to keep in your head all the pieces parts unless you're in the code, in the debugger, and going, oh, right, I have this is the, this is how these all link up. Anyway, um, can, go ahead. Can, um, uh, would you be able to describe um, about that, about the, the setting of that value? Um, Here? On the upstream and the downstream, at what time is it, do you expect it to be set? At what time do you expect it to be none? Right. And where, like in the upstream versus the downstream, when is the value invented? Or is it always the value of the pulp ID? And at what points is it coming from another place? Correct. Um, in the upstream, export ID is a column. So the export ID is a, a field on the content model, which means it's a column in the database in Postgres in the core content table. And in a pulp instance that is an upstream or that never uses import export, it's always null. It's never filled in. When you export um, a pulp instance, the export ID is filled in into the export file. It's not in the database. It's just in the file that is stuck out on the file system that you're going to use to hand off to your downstream object. So the first place where, where it gets filled in is at export time, the pulp ID of a given row is stuck into the export ID for that row in, in the file that is now put out on the file system. You pick that file up, you move it to your downstream, and you import it. At import time, it that the whatever's in that um, that field in the CSV or in the JSON um, export ends up in the database on the downstream when you persist the entity. When you save the model that has an export ID incoming, then it's going to be persisted in the database, which is critical because it has to be persisted in the database for this line right here to work. We have to be able to say, go find content that has an export ID. This works because import is order dependent. And we already have functionality that you know, we showed off in a previous uh, description or demo. Um, the import process imports entries, imports uh, uh, data types in an in a order dependent manner. So that in this case, we are in the content artifact import. And you can't do that. It doesn't make any sense to try to recreate content artifact until all the content has been imported and all the artifacts have been imported. And now we can import content resource. And because we're doing this in an order dependent way, we can rely on this line finding a piece of content that has a filled in export ID that matches the pulp ID, which is in the content field of the incoming row. And I wish I could say that simpler. That's how that works. <laughs> no, no, that's good. That's good. So um, if I can just try to summarize the parts that I understand. So um, export ID is is null on the upstream systems or none null, I guess, for yeah. pretty much all cases. It's filled out in the file, um, and it gets the actual pulp ID of various objects. And then on the importing system, it is persisted. And it is the last time it was imported mm -hmm. because, in theory, I mean, I'm, I'm, I guess unless you're importing from multiple systems, I don't know. That's not really a use case that I'm even worried about. But anyways, um, it seems like it ex import. I'm sorry, export ID won't be changing on the downstream often. Is that right? I mean, there's a number of use cases we actually thought of, Brian, where it will change. Um, I do an export I, um, from an upstream. I import it on a downstream. Then on the upstream, I delete an entire repository and all of its versions, and I recreate it and resync it. So now I have, you know, I have Fedora 31 updates, and I exported it and imported it. I deleted it. Now I recreated it from scratch. They're all new pulp IDs, and I export it and I import it again. And the thing is, with the way this works, 
we will reuse almost all those objects. I think I convinced myself that we might end up in that case with um, abandoned, if you will, entries in I think it was content artifact, in fact, was the only one where we might not notice that the incoming thing is the same as the outgoing thing, except that content artifact also has a unique unique keys where, because it has content and relative path. Um, but because the incoming thing has a new pulp ID, you'll end up with the, the content ID and the artifact ID from the before time sitting in content artifact. And then you'll have content ID and um, uh, artifact ID from the new incoming one, um, the content ID will be different. So that'll be shown as a new, a, a different row in content artifact resource. And we will not notice and update the existing one. Um, Are you sure? So I thought the way it worked is that the artifact is already there, the content yep. is already there, the export IDs get updated to the new export IDs and upstream yep. pull. Yep. But the content artifact uses uh, the existing content IDs. So I think it just keeps the same content artifact record. I don't think it creates a new one. We'll have to we'll have to test that, David, because I think I went I convinced myself of both sides of this depending on when we were looking at testing this. Uh, it's definitely an edge case though. And the only time the the only use case where we might end up with abandoned entities in the downstream that shouldn't be there is when you have deleted things in the upstream and then recreated the exact same thing and then done the same export. Otherwise, otherwise, using this process, the the import side will find the existing objects and reuse them. It'll just update them if necessary or not. If it decides, no, this is fine. Everything is point. Excuse me, pointing where it needs to point. It just ignores the the row and yeah. continues on. So my understanding was that it would update the content record instead of creating a new one. And if that's the case, I think there's going to be a uniqueness constraint on content artifact. That would pull yeah, up. and it might. Yeah, and um, I think actually this highlighted line for me, I don't know very much about this, but um, this highlighted line kind of tells the tale, right? Because um, I think, you know, when the upstream has has uh, objects deleted and recreated, their pulp IDs will change. Mm -hmm. And then at, when those are exported, the export ID will change. Yep. And yet those objects are still in the downstream. And I believe when it goes to perform this git that you've highlighted right here, it won't find it. No, so what it will do is it will first import the content record and then update its export ID to the upstream mm -hmm. uh, Pulp ID, and then it will grab yes. that record, so it will find it. Right? Yes, that is correct. Oh yeah, exactly right, exactly right. Thank you, David. You said that way more succinctly. In fact, I would. Yes, that is correct. So does that have so, to do with the with the layering, or like yes. with the phases where you update all of the? It's like the dependency graph of relationships. You have to update yep. all the leaf nodes, model yep. types first. And you're David. You're saying, if I understand you right, you're you're saying when that occurs it will get the correct export IDs. And then when the later phase occurs with the other model types and the relationship needs to be formed, it will be able to find them correctly. Yep. Yeah. That, that is exactly correct. And okay, in fact, sweet. One of the changes that is made when I'm in the, in the proof of concept for this is content artifact is the last thing that gets um, uh, imported at downstream. Everything else has to exist and then content artifact is recreated because it has to be able to link to all the things that exist. And that's exactly why it has to have done not just the core imports for a given incoming repository version to be created. It has to do all of the plugins that are uh, represented by whatever repo version we're importing at this point so that those detail objects are persisted so that their core content is persisted. And then after all that happens, an artifact is the first thing we bring in, and everybody else is in and quiescent. Then we can rebuild content artifact, and then we're done. Does that help? Yeah, I think how I understand it now, when the complete import is finished, the export IDs lose their meanings. Correct. I mean, they're there, okay. but they're Thank not you. useful. They're not useful. That's exactly yeah. right. That's exactly right. The only, uh, and this is a minor use case, in a, in a debugging or support point of view, 
if you if you know both upstream and downstream and you're looking at the downstream and going why the hell is this like this you can take the export id and truck over to the upstream and say hey go find the piece of content that has this pulp id and then you know maybe it'll help you debug the problem um, that's a minor it's it's kind of emergent behavior not the intent at all the intent is export id is used at import time and after that it's pointless Other questions. These are great, by the way. You're you're definitely helping me cement in my head how this works, even though I wrote the code. <laughs> okay, I'm going to move along. So content artifact is the key, and if you all kind of grok this at least to some degree, then you've you've got your hands around the core of the problem that we needed to solve, the hardest problem to solve. Uh, the rest of this is a very specific example. And I'm not going to go through it point by point. We kind of went through all this. Um, the diagrams here are just because I could not keep the relationships between the tables in my head without pictures. So here are some. <laughs> and you can see that you know export ID is on the content object. Um, anything in red is, is A, or at least part of A. A unique key on a given table, and we've implemented this, and we we see it work correctly in both file and in RPM. So there's a bigger diagram here. I'm not going to blow it up. It's just this is um, uh, Django admin has a graphing functionality that Tanya showed me and, and saved me like three days worth of trying to draw these boxes by hand. Um, I'm not going to go through that in a lot of detail. All right, I'm, I'm going to go over some questions here. First thing, this is really complicated, as you've noticed, and plugin authors are definitely going to hate us if they have to do this. That's a true statement. However, we've created a base of uh, resource. Resource is the Django import export word that says this is a thing that that exports and imports a model. You have a model resource. So we have a base resource that says, okay, first of all. I don't, if your con, this is for uh, any detail, anything that is a subclass of content, you can have your resource be a subclass of base content resource. And what that gives you is don't export any of these fields because you downstream doesn't own them. So we're not going to put those in the export file. Uh, because we don't want them to be recreated downstream. It also makes the export a little smaller. And uh, also you don't have to implement the dehydrate export ID will do it for you. So those disappear out of your code. Um, so that, for example, the file content resource, which is a subclass of that base content right there, the only thing the plugin author has to do here is say, OK, I have given you, you can rely on having a repository version available. That's the thing that we are exporting, and that happens in the query model resource, it's it's uh, once it's created, what it has in it is here's the repo version that I need you to, to export. So it's you can rely on that being there. And what we need you to do in the set of query set is, hey, plugin author, tell us how to find your thing, your model, in this case, the file content, based on knowing just the repo version. And for file content, it's really it's pretty easy. Just find find all the file content objects where that are in the the content of the repo version that we know about so you have to set up your query set then you have to tell us what model you're the resource for then you have to tell us what your import id fields are so we can figure out how to uniquely identify you at import time and then you're done this is the entire amount of code that the file content uh, plugin author had to write in order to be able to export and import this uh, entity um, and we might even be able to do better than this i haven't I stopped looking, but at some point I'd like to be able to push this into the base as well, so that the uh, <coughs> so the resource author only has to set up the query set and tell us what his model is. Okay, what about entities that don't use those helpers because they have the problem that we're solving? They don't have a unique a unique constraint other than uh, pulp ID, or possibly they only have uh, a unique constraint that's multiple um, multiple keys. And they're not content, um, so they have to basically do something like this, like we're describing it here themselves. And wouldn't that be terrible? And the answer is, yeah, it, it kind of is. But at least we have an example of how to approach the problem. Um, I think RPM may have one, and we haven't, we don't 
yet export all the RPM modules. That's one of the things Tanya opened uh, an issue on. I think one of them, we are probably going to have to do something a whole lot like export ID and content, but we're going to be doing it in a, in a plug-in model because it's not a detail, if that makes sense to everybody. Um, the short answer is we are probably going to have to follow the same pattern in plugins for the more complicated uh, model linkages. Um, then Tanya sent a bunch of questions. Uh, I'm not, I don't think everybody on this call saw them, but a number of you did. I threw them in the document here. Um, like she got confused in the example because I was using U and D and not explaining them. I did change the example for that. What if we change the fields which are being exported? Um, do we, do we have to redo a full export and how do we determine that? David had exactly the right answer here is, and we mentioned this at the beginning, the way export works, when you are when you do a full export, you get all the artifacts and all the database content. When you do an incremental export, which is a partial export, the only thing partial about it is the artifacts. You only get the artifacts that are different between the last time you did this and now, or between the two versions that you're exporting, but you still get all the full set of database uh, data for recreating the repository version that you are exporting. Um, and that means that if it gets added, as David says right here, if it gets added or updated upstream, it'll get updated during the import uh, uh, in downstream at import time. Um, this is another complicated one. If you have a model with no natural key, appears downstream first. You try to import the same co the same content from upstream. Um, if the and as David said here. If there is a uniqueness constraint for whatever that model is, we'll find it. Not using the pulp ID or the export ID, we'll find it using the uniqueness constraint. We will update its, uh, it, you know, give it a new pulp ID um, and update its export ID at that import time. If there isn't a uniqueness constraint, then I'm not sure how we're going to solve this, but I'm not sure how much sense it makes to say we have entities in our data model where there's no way, including pulp ID, to uniquely identify them. Because the only place where this is a problem is if you have a table that you're exporting that doesn't have pulp ID as its primary key and doesn't have a uniqueness constraint. And I think that's a bridge that will burn when we're standing on it. Um, the only place that I can think of where that, that might make even a little bit of sense is if there's a mapping, a many-to-many -many between, between two tables. And those mappings aren't exported, they're created when you recreate the links on the downstream. So they're, they become a non-issue in this context because they are not explicitly imported. Did that make sense? Because that's a complicated one. Okay, I'm going to assume that that is consent or at least everyone's so confused they just want me to stop talking. Um, and this is the case that we talked about, what happens if I remove content from the upstream and then I upload it back and I perform the export, um, one export before removing and then one after I've added it back. And again, David answered this one really well. Um, and the only time, again, that we have a problem here is when there isn't a unique key combination, we might end up with, um, abandoned rows, but I can't convince myself that that actually happens. So that's another one where I it might, I could see a way for that to happen, but it would be a very edge of an edge case. Um, but it is something we have to keep an eye out for as we're, as we're implementing the, um, the model resources and doing the testing for this with the more complicated uh, plugins. Uh, let's see, another one. Uh, Tanya suggested maybe something, um, Uh, uh, something other than pulp ID and the the problem is there are a bunch of things where there is only pulp ID there isn't anything else and you could use something else you could I mean that we could make export ID be just a string field and you could put in whatever you wanted into it um, but that doesn't actually help the problem uh, it doesn't get you any further um, and you just end up putting pushing the the onus of figuring out this onto even more so onto the plugin author 
uh, in a way that isn't actually useful. It just adds work without actually giving them that much more control. Um, and I think that's what we said here. Yeah, that mostly we're using, we're relying in this case for things that to send from content on export ID equaling pulp ID and doing that at the content level in core because that makes things much easier on the plugin authors for a, a majority of their use cases. Hey, Grant. Yeah. Um, well, this last this last one is one that I just pasted in there, so you already addressed that. Um, can we go back to the the second to last question from Tanya? Um, okay. I, I was Which just one? reading her question. The remove. Uh, yeah. This uh, is what. Well, yeah. wait. Uh, let's see. Uh, I had it on my document. Uh, uh, it's th what happens when a model with no natural key and one with export ID appears in downstream first and you try to import the same content from upstream. Right. I don't think I fully understood. I read, I just read the comments again here. Right. And I guess my question is, will it duplicate the object in the database on downstream or not? I wasn't clear. It probably will. Yes. Yeah. And that makes sense because kind of like what your comments say, yep, there's right nothing for it. There's nothing for it to know. Like how yeah, could exactly it possibly right. know? Like I mean, yep. the way the problem, the way the question positions the problem is it's the situation where there isn't something that you already know. Um, yep. So I don't see how we can do any better. I guess my question is, is in, from a practical perspective, is there a situation where we're going to run into a uniqueness constraint? No, I mean, I could. There was ahead, David. Yeah, I was going to say no because if there was a uniqueness constraint, then we would probably use it to export. Yeah. Yep. Okay. All right. Exactly. Great. Exactly. Great. That's that's uh, that, that's satisfies this for me. Um, can I ask another question? No, please. Yes, please. Um, can so uh, ha the motivation the place? Here's my question: <laughs> Which models are the ones that are planned to receive export ID? Yep. In the, the implementation. Right. The only place that export ID exists is in content itself. Actually, let me see. Uh, is that here? What am I in? Because everything else has sends, yeah, other gonna, things which can be used. And the um, I'm not sure if I'm looking at the right code here. I had this up earlier today to check something out. Uh, and cont no, and I content don't have artifact anything. also? No, content artifact doesn't have export ID. Content artifact gets created by taking advantage of export ID. So I don't care oh, what yeah. content artifact's ID is. I just care about what it points to. The okay, so here's the here's a key that I don't think um, I may not have called out. It's just implied by all this. When we export, we do not export the content objects explicitly. We export the detail objects because what ends up happening at import time is it takes that incoming row and it creates a model. You know, it says, give me a new file content, fill it in with this information and then persist it. Just as if you were writing code and creating a file object, uh, you know, from scratch or just, but you're writing Python code to do that. You don't create a content object and persist it and then create a file object that knows about that content object and persist that. You just said, give me a file object. I'm going to fill this stuff in and then I'm going to save it and it gets persisted. And along yep. the way, because the way detail master works, you get the detail and you get the core content row at the same time. So the, the detail object doesn't have to know about export ID explicitly. It has it because there's a content object backing it that has export ID. So the plugin author of the, the plugins that use just that use things that are sub that are details that are that subclass from content, they don't have to say anything about export ID. All this happens for free, if you will, uh, for those for those entities. Does yeah, that, and that, that, that makes yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, that definitely helps me. That's super clear. So then, what about? content artifacts how does that fall into do the do content artifacts actually get exported or do they also get kind of implicitly created content the content um entity and i'm trying to avoid the word artifact because that means has its own specific meaning the content entity if you will the core content table in the database does not get explicitly exported yeah yeah i got that right? part but okay but content content artifact is a different table exactly right content artifact 
does get explicitly exported, but we don't include its pulp ID, all we're really in including in that is what's the content you point to, what's the artifact that you point to, and what's your relative path. Now, that may change with the discussions we're having about about content artifact, but those are the three pieces of data that aren't created or updated or pulp ID. And so at import time of the content artifact um, model resource, that before import hook, uh, which is further up, let me go look at that before import hook explicitly, because this is this is exactly the, the, the worst part of the problem. So here we are, we're importing a row of content artifact. And what it has in it is a relative path, which we're not going to touch. The artifact has the, has a SHA-256 and uses a foreign key widget. So it doesn't care about IDs, right? It's using it's looking up artifacts to fill in the pointer correctly uh, based on the SHA-256 of the artifact that it pointed to upstream. Then when we import the content itself, the content pointer in that row, which is an upstream pulp ID, that's what we get. So we are going to use that upstream pulp ID from the row. We're going to find here and downstream the content object that has an export ID that matches the upstream pulp ID. And then we're going to reset the content pointer that we haven't imported yet to be the pulp ID of our downstream object. So we throw away the upstream one and replace it with the already persisted downstream one. And then we return from this hook and the rest of import happens and that row and content artifact gets persisted into the, into the database. So, um, so let me just tell this back to see if I understand it. Absolutely. Um, I think this is clear. So um, the only place that actually receives an export ID is content. Correct, and yes. we don't actually, it's, we don't actually export it specifically. We only export the detail versions, and export Correct. ID is is on each of those. Correct. At in the exported um, metadata. Correct. Uh, and content artifact um, uses this what's showing on your screen here, roughly, um, to content artifact. It refers to the detail content, and it does so also using that export ID. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, like, if I were to like open up the metadata file for a content artifact for that portion of the JSON export, yep. I'll see export IDs in there. Correct. Because that's what provides the relation to the other metadata file where the detail content is exported. And what? Well, no, and you it's, won't. It's, if you open, hang on, I need to stop you. If you open content yeah. artifact, you will not see export ID. Content artifact does not have an export ID. The content has an export ID. Content artifact yep. is relying on that to be able to find a piece of content to point to. So linked content in this case is the, the downstream thing that was created and persisted, whose downstream pulp ID we can use to fill in to replace the upstream pulp ID that came into in content artifact. Does that make sense? Does that help? It 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 does make it it certainly helps in correcting my understanding, which I appreciate. But how does at import time the content artifact know which content it's related with? Because it has incoming, it has a row that has the word content in it, and that that um, that keyword value is a pulp ID, which is the upstream pulp ID of the content that content artifact was linked to upstream. So that's the that's actual the real pulp ID. It's not, that's the it's real, not also using this export ID. In this con in, in at this line right here, this and this right here, row content is the upstream pulp ID of the um, the that this content artifact row pointed to upstream. Is that clear? Because that's really that's the key to this. Right at this moment, row content has an upstream pulp ID that wants to point into the content, the core content table. And obviously that pulp ID doesn't exist downstream as a pulp ID because we didn't, it's not, it doesn't, we do not override pulp ID. So what we're doing is we're using that upstream pulp ID and we're looking for it as an export ID 
in the content table. And that's finding us the downstream object whose export ID matches what its upstream pulp ID was. So now we have the downstream um, object. Go ahead. Yeah, so um, this, all, this all sounds great. I have no concerns about that. Um, I'm just, I'm trying to make sure that I understand it. Um, and uh, the thing that I think would help me would be if I could see later, like not now, some, just some like little examples of like, hey, here's like, I exported a, a single content unit yep. from a system. And here's an example of the JSON files it produced. Oh God, I've, um, uh, I mean, I can, so I, I can, I can send you what? the a tar gzip actually was because we only have two minutes left and there's another meeting coming up. Yep. I want to be respectful of time. I can send you a tar gzip where this, that is an export um, that has this code in place because um, that happens to be what my dev instance is running right now. Um, if they and, or I even add... attach it to this document, which is, which is yeah. then that tar gzip is, has just one, um, it's just a file export of a single file repository version. Yep. With three that would be amazing. three entities. Oh, so I have that, and I will I'll attach it to the doc to the doc. That would that would literally just take me just the last little mile in my understanding. Absolutely. Um, absolutely. But overall, this sounds really great. Thank you so much. Yeah, absolutely. Um, oh, the no, last I question I wanted that. to ask was: Is export ID the best name? And I don't know if the answer to that is yes, but I have no idea. It seems to be used. Yeah, yeah, I think it should be import ID. I agree. Import ID because it's used at importing. Okay, I can do that. Uh, actually, let me. Well, think about it. I'm not sure if that's the best. Upstream ID. Ooh, I actually, you know what? I like a upstream ID, but because it's a very explicit. I have another small question. Um, you said we can always refer to the artifacts via their SHA two fifty six. Is import export only working for repository versions that are completely available, or is it yes. also working for lazy no, things one, ones? No, that's one of the uh, initial. That's an, an initial um, hard requirement because yeah. if okay. it's lazy yeah. synced, this makes no sense because your downstream isn't allowed to create things. It doesn't have an internet connection. So if you don't that. if you don't have the artifacts, you can't export them. Um, Thank you. An import ID or uh, what did you suggest, Matthias? That I really liked upstream. Upstream, upstream ID. I'll write those down and we'll we'll give them some thought. If anybody has better names, throw them here on this question. Um, that's a very good point, and that's a good question. Um, what else? We have well, we're out of time. Um, I'm go I'm going to stop sharing here. I really appreciate this. This has been very helpful. Has it been helpful to everyone else is the question. Yeah, some comments for cool. sure. Very cool. OK, um, if you think of more questions, please add them to the doc. Um, I will add the um, I'll add the a tar gzip to this that has an example of an export because that may help people understand this a little better. Take a look at that if you've got some time. And thank you so much for coming in and asking great questions. Uh, this has really helped cement this in my head. Um, and hopefully it's uh, made it a little clearer to everybody else. I'm going to end recording. No, I'm not going to end recording. Hang on. Now I'm going to end recording.